When contemplating Japan from a distant perspective, one can see a vibrant country with advancements in robotics, ancient traditions, and low crime rates. Boasting the third most robust economy on the planet, a healthy population, and internationally renowned companies, it is easy to view it as an exemplary nation. However, Delving deeper into its reality reveals a less visible side. Despite all its achievements, there is a darker aspect to the lives of many Japanese citizens. Approximately 15% of the population feels displaced, living on the fringes of society, in isolation, with no prospects for employment, marriage, or a promising future. They are known as the displaced generation, a reflection of the gaps that have formed in Japanese social structure. This hidden facet is a seldom-discussed topic when speaking of the nation. Going back to the 1980s, Japan was seen as the rising economic force that could overshadow the United States. It was commonly thought that it would soon be at the pinnacle of the world economy, a notion analogous to the current perception of China. The U.S.'s concern about Japan's expansion was so intense that it was dubbed an economic Pearl Harbor. Productions of that era, such as Die Hard, Rising Sun, and Blade Runner portrayed the idea of an imminent Japanese corporate dominance. The remarkable rise of Japan, often referred to as the East Asian Miracle, was built on three decades of continuous economic progress, anchored in a distinct economic system. At its core, the system prioritized a close partnership between powerful business groups and the Japanese state. These groups, known as Kiretsu, consisted of networks of large Japanese corporations that, by sharing stock ownership, cooperated extensively with each other. With strong government support, including favorable loans from the Bank of Japan, these groups had the means to assert themselves on the world stage. As Japan sailed through seas of growth and innovation, the state created obstacles to hinder the penetration of international companies into its territory. Despite debates about its fairness and long-term viability, the system proved effective. The Japanese stock market experienced golden times, and its products were coveted worldwide. The prevailing idea was that, armed with a higher education degree and dedication to work, job stability in a major corporation was guaranteed. The nation seemed invincible, until an unexpected setback occurred. For 30 years until 1991, Japan experienced impressive growth, positioning itself as the world's second-largest economic power surpassed only by the United States. During this period, property and stock market values also soared. However, as the late 1980s approached, this expansion proved to be volatile, culminating in a financial bubble. Optimism was so high that many believed this boom would last forever. As the scenario inflated, the Japanese central bank maintained a policy of easy money issuance and credit lending. But inevitably, the bubble burst. In 1990, the stock market took a 43% plunge, and the real estate market followed suit. The domino effect deeply shook the country's economy, Japanese consumer spending contracted, and investments in local businesses stagnated, marking the decline of a golden era. The situation worsened when, in the years following the bursting of the bubble, indications of structural flaws emerged. Revelations of widespread corruption in the corporate and governmental sectors came to light. From stock market manipulations and shady transactions to fraud and bribes, the trustworthiness of the Japanese system was seriously questioned, overshadowing a previously seen exemplary history of economic success. The policy of the Japanese central bank to make credit almost limitless gave rise to the emergence of numerous zombie companies, entities that, under normal conditions, would have ceased their operations but continued to exist thanks to easy access to financial resources. In a decade, Japan saw its image shift from being the Asian giant to the ailing patient of Asia. While economic fluctuations occur worldwide, in Japan, the decline had particularly profound effects on a generation, with many never being able to regain their stability. To decipher this scenario, it is crucial to observe the unique Japanese work culture, marked by intensity and nuances that set it apart globally. In the country, the professional journey typically begins with a specific recruitment process for recent graduates. Large corporations often conduct massive annual hiring drives during a single period. Once integrated, employees tend to follow a predetermined career path, aiming for leadership positions in the future. This model, 
widely adopted in the 1990s, still resonates in contemporary Japan. Such a model provides a certain level of predictability, but at the same time, it rigidifies the labor market. It ends up marginalizing those who might deviate from the traditional path, making it difficult for them to re-enter the job market. This inflexibility, combined with the aftermath of the financial bubble and the persistence of zombie companies, resulted in a generation of disillusioned and economically stagnant young Japanese individuals, intensifying the socioeconomic challenges faced by the country. In Japan, to secure a desirable position, the window of opportunity typically opens shortly after completing one's undergraduate studies. Once established in a company, loyalty throughout one's professional journey is expected. On the flip side, failing to integrate into this mechanism often means being left on the sidelines of a solid career path. This strict career model was shaken by the bursting of the Japanese financial bubble in the 1990s. During the boom years, there was relative ease in securing positions in corporations. However, the economic downturn resulted in a halt in hiring at many companies, safeguarding only those already employed. When hiring resumed in the early 21st century, the landscape had transformed. Those who completed their studies during the decline of the 1990s found themselves in limbo. They were no longer seen as newcomers and thus did not fit into the new opportunities. Essentially, an entire generation was marginalized relegated to temporary and low-paying positions. This period became known as the Ice Age of Opportunities, and those affected are often referred to as the mismatched generation. The complexity of this situation is compounded by the fact that Japan never fully regained its vigor, leading more recent graduates in the subsequent decades to share the fate of this earlier mismatched generation. The outcome is what many call the mismatched decades, marked by three decades of stagnation and disappointment. This adversity doesn't only impact members of the so-called mismatched generation. They constitute a significant fraction of the Japanese demographic, around 15%, equating to nearly 17 million individuals. Most of them are in their 30s and 40s, with many still living with their parents, lacking the financial stability to start their own families or pursue stable careers. This outlook casts a dark cloud over Japan's prospects with an entire generation nearly disconnected from the workforce and vital social structures that sustain a cohesive and active society. The driving force of an economy often comes from individuals in their 30s to 40s. This segment of the population typically concentrates higher spending on household needs, properties, loans, and vehicles, energizing the economic cycle. However, in Japan, this dynamic is on the decline, and economic issues are just the tip of the iceberg. Japan now faces the challenge of hyper-aging. It has the highest global percentage of elderly citizens, with nearly one-third of the population heading towards advanced age. This configuration is a direct outcome of the mismatched generation, which has produced fewer offspring. Projections indicate that by 2050, the ratio of elderly to the working age population will be 1 to 1.3, almost equating the number of individuals above 65 years old with those between 15 and 64 years old. On a global scale, the elderly population is supported by the taxes of active workers. However, in Japan, this balance is on the brink of tilting. Additionally, the mismatched generation has led to a new social crisis, the emergence of hikikomori. This term describes individuals, whether young or older, who choose to completely withdraw from social life, plunging into deep isolation. They often become dependent on their families, avoiding any form of interaction with the outside world. The earliest adopters of such behavior belong to the mismatched generation, predominantly men now in their 40s, who failed to conform to traditional norms of Japanese society. However, younger generations, even in the face of professional opportunities, have felt pressured by the competitive and demanding work environment. Today, it is estimated that around 1 million Japanese citizens experience this reality, posing a serious problem for the country. Japanese authorities are aware of the negative repercussions of the mismatched generation and the hikikomori issue on the socio-economic structure. Various strategies have been suggested to reintegrate these individuals into society, but progress has been limited. The unfavorable economic situation, coupled with a rigid professional culture, makes resolving these challenges a Herculean task. In the Japanese workplace, 
There are strict standards and high expectations. In many corporations, it is common for workers to fulfill extensive hours of service, which in some cases can extend to nearly 20 hours a day. The hierarchical structures within companies are well-defined, and many of them follow a lifelong employment model, conducting hiring processes only annually and valuing internal promotion. This model makes it challenging for professionals to change careers and puts those who did not enter the corporate sector from the beginning at a disadvantage. As a result, a growing segment of society is tied to this dynamic, with the proportion increasing as new young individuals enter the workforce. Alongside these socioeconomic challenges, Japan is home to one of the most infamous criminal organizations globally, the Yakuza. Its roots extend back to the 17th century, a period when samurais dominated. Groups called Bakuto, initially formed by gamblers living on the fringes of society, began to organize into factions known as Rinkodantai. These associations were guided by honorable principles, resembling the codes of samurais. Over the years, these groups evolved, giving rise to the Yakuza. Gradually, this criminal organization diversified its operations, becoming involved in practices such as extortion, illicit trafficking, and underground gambling. Today, the influence of the Yakuza is not as predominant as before. Government actions, strict legislation, and social changes have reduced their activities. Even with significant portions of their businesses being dismantled and leaders being apprehended, the Yakuza still maintains a presence in more traditional sectors of the country. Adapting to the changing times, they have diversified their activities, branching into areas such as the real estate market and the entertainment industry. Despite these changes, they remain steadfast in their values of honor and group loyalty. For tourists in Japan, direct contact with the Yakuza is rarely a cause for concern. They tend to keep their distance from direct involvement with the general public and authorities. Their actions nowadays are more discreet, focusing on sectors like property, trade, and nightlife. However, it's important to note that even with the decline of the Yakuza, the Japanese criminal underworld still faces issues, with human trafficking and prostitution being among the most profitable and problematic areas. When delving into the deeper layers of Japanese society, it's undeniable that there is an impact on street workers. While strolling through Japanese cities, it's not uncommon to come across young people distributing flyers and promoting various venues, such as cafes and bars. However, what may appear to be an innocent advertising strategy, in some cases, has ties to the Yakuza. There are establishments that, under the guise of legitimate operation, harbor underground activities, many of which are related to sexual exploitation. Tourists, especially foreigners, can fall victim to various schemes in these areas. On the streets, it's crucial to be aware of deceptive tactics. One example is the charity fraud, where contributions are solicited for a supposed charitable project. There are also tourist charmers, women who attract visitors with more resources, taking advantage of their financial favors before mysteriously disappearing. Furthermore, in certain bars, drinks may seem affordable, but at the end of the night, the bill can come with surprisingly high amounts. Many of these schemes, directly or indirectly, are intertwined with the tentacles of the Yakuza. Undoubtedly, one of the most lucrative sources of income for this organization is sexual exploitation. Iconic locations, recognized as red-light districts, are home to establishments that, despite presenting themselves as spas or bistros, conceal underground sexual commerce. A significant number of women in this milieu are ensnared by human trafficking networks, originating from more vulnerable Southeast Asian countries, enticed by deceptive promises of employment. However, it would be a mistake to attribute this entire reality solely to the Yakuza. The landscape is multifaceted, from students turning to prostitution, to finance their education, to women coerced to leave their home nations under false pretenses. Reflecting on these nuances, we realize that Japan, like many nations, presents profound dilemmas that oppose the often projected idyllic image. What other nuances or maladies associated with Japan do you identify? Share your thoughts in the comments. And if you enjoyed the video, please click the like button and subscribe to stay updated on new content. Until next time.